I grew up in a typical Catholic family. We went to church every Sunday, and my parents sent me to Catholic school from kindergarten to 12th grade. My experience of Catholicism as a kid was really unfulfilling. It didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Mass was boring, <laughs> and the church was kind of just a mystery. When I was a kid, I lived a pretty ordinary, ordinary life, and you know, I wasn't super Catholic or super into my faith. You know, my parents took me to mass you know, on the weekends, which I was very grateful for. Although um, at the time, I would kind of go kicking and screaming, and I didn't really kind of see my place, sort of in where where I fit in in this whole you know faith experience and in the life of the church. It didn't really make sense to me. By the time I was a teenager, it seemed like none of it was really real, that I wasn't finding any of my needs met by God or the church or the sacraments or scripture. And so I strayed, I strayed far away from the Lord. It just made a lot more sense to me that God wasn't really real. When I was in eighth grade, I went on a retreat um, with this local youth group, and that's when I started to realize, you know, this Catholic faith is really important and means something, and there's something bigger than me here. Everything changed for me in high school when I met a young woman, and she lived for me the beauty of the Christian faith. Her example to me was life-changing. I could see the joy in her eyes, and I would hear her talk about God in a way like I had never heard anyone do so before. And I thought, if that's how she loves Jesus, then Jesus must be so much different from who I think he is. He must be real. I didn't always want to be a priest. It wasn't until my sophomore year in high school. I remember the day. It was Sunday, October 24th, 2010. I went to confession with a priest. I was a sophomore in high school at the time. I was 16 years old. And I was really discouraged. I was really down on myself. And when I went into that confession, I just sort of laid it all out on the table and I kind of held nothing back whenever I was speaking to him. And despite the discouragement that I walked into that confession with, um, he spoke truth into my life. And he spoke truth into areas where I was um, believing lies and where I was kind of um, losing hope. When I left that confession while I was in the side chapel uh, praying my penance, um, I came to this realization of, I want to be able to do that for other people. People used to joke when I was in third grade or so and said, oh, you'd make a great priest, but I said, okay, whatever. I don't even know what that's about. Um, it really wasn't until when I was a sophomore in high school, um, sitting there in our 10-person confirmation class, and our pastor came down, uh, Father Sibby, a small Indian pastor, and he just stared at us and he said, two men need to come to a dinner with the bishop. Who will come? So I kind of felt guilt tripped, so I just said, fine, yeah, I'll come. You know, I never really thought much about being a priest as a kid. I always wanted to be a pilot and fly airplanes. And it wasn't until a woman said to me when I was about 16, you know, I just don't think that God wants you to lock up all of your experiences and your talents and your love for him and for your brothers and sisters. That'd be like locking all of that away in the cockpit of an airplane and never really sharing it with anybody. That experience really broke my heart open and I realized that I was called to something so much more. And Father Brad got up and he talked about vocations. He talked about how he didn't want us to become priests. He wanted us to know what God was calling us to. And I'd never really heard anybody talk about vocations like that, what God's calling us to. And he said, what God is calling you to will really make you happy. And something struck a chord with me with that, uh, that it would really make me happy. Then he asked every priest in the room to share a joy of the priesthood. And I remember one old 90-year-old Monsignor banging the table um, about his ordination day and how beautiful it was to promise obedience to his bishop for the rest of his life. Um, so I signed a little card that said I might want some more information about it. Uh, after that, I kind of started thinking about the priesthood. My biggest fear entering seminary, and a fear that I still have today, is just the fear of not being enough. The priests that I've known growing up uh, were oftentimes larger than life characters. I think a big hesitation I had going to the seminary was I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Um, 
I grew up in the middle of the country. I never met a seminarian. Uh, I didn't go to Catholic high school. I thought, I'm not qualified for this at all. All of those fears of inadequacy, insufficiency, they're all turned inward. They're all turned in on himself. Can I do it? Can I do it? Am I able to? Will I be able to? And all that turning in on self is deadly. And so getting off the self and getting into the openness of, can you do it in me? Will you do it in me? And noticing day by day how that happens personally, concretely, and truly in his day-to-day -day lived experience, that's what the seminary's for, to finally tune a man to how Jesus does it in him. Because those kinds of inadequacies and insufficiencies, they're always gonna be there. Uh, but they're not from the Lord. I think yeah, the fears will be determined by each uh, man. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's fear of maybe disappointing a family. Sometimes it's fear of commitment. In today's world, the Facebook generation, they have this acronym of FOMO, fear of missing out. So often it's a fear of committing to something. And then what's underneath it is they think uh, they kind of have a wrong sense of discernment. They think they have to know with an absolute certitude that they're called before they enter. Is this really the call? Is this really what God is calling me to? And the lifelong reality. And so the fear of commitment starts coming up for some guys. The grief of not having a family. The fear of losing out on having a family. And so some of those deeper griefs and fears can ebb and flow through a man's heart. But that's all meant to be offered. And he's not meant to experience that alone. The seminary is meant to walk with him through those. But if he has the gifts of priesthood alive in him, and if he's experiencing Jesus Christ as calling him to priesthood, there's gonna be great assurance and great gifts throughout. From a rural diocese, not too many people around, we just closed about 30 parishes in my diocese, so there's a fear sometimes of, am I gonna be alone or are there gonna be people around? But I've been really encouraged by experiencing solitude with God and realizing that there's a difference between isolation being alone and solitude, being alone with God. I remember I was directing a seminarian and he said that, well, he didn't have the gift of celibacy because he thought that that gift meant that he would never feel loneliness uh, if he was married. And I kind of chuckled. I said, no, married people feel loneliness. That is something, a part of the human condition. But it's what do you do with it? Are you able to, if you're called to celibacy, unite it with Christ on the cross? Uh, be with him and be with Mary and the saints calling out. And that's why intimacy with the Lord is essential. Sometimes I'll hear men talk about, if I want a family, and the more I want a family, the more that means I'm not called to priesthood. And that's an insidious lie. Because a man called to priesthood is called the Father God's family. And so the greater his desire for family, the greater his capacity to be a husband and father and spouse to the church. And so we're looking for those great-souled, great-hearted men who have a great capacity for fatherhood, a great capacity for a, a spousal life. I see now, after years of being in seminary and approaching the priesthood, that it's precisely here that Jesus has awoken in me this incredible spiritual fatherhood that I couldn't have imagined before. I think of celibacy as something wild and it's beautiful. I mean, the most beautiful things in, in, in nature are wild things. And, and celibacy is part of that wildness of Jesus. He's not domesticated and yet he's the gentlest of men. He's not isolated. He's the bridegroom, he's the spouse of the whole of the church. And so he's a man of communion, and yet he's a man of celibacy. And that's what's brought together in the training of the seminary. A man is trained how to pray and how to live a life that's not a bachelor life, it's not a single life, it's not an isolated life. It's a life of receiving from God for the sake of his people. You know, in the priesthood, we're called, to, and we do actually in the ordination, we lay down on the floor. In the religious orders, they actually put a pall over, and certain orders put a pall over the man because it's complete death to himself. He has given himself wholly, completely, and undividedly 
as in a marriage. And with that, once again, that means that it's just not about doing something. It's not a type of functionalism where, okay, I'll do the mass and then I'll do this and then I'll go home and I'll take off my priest clothes. It's part of who you are. Your soul is marked with an indelible mark. The priesthood isn't a job. It's not something I could live four or five or six days a week. It's a vocation. It's a way of life, a continual conversion that I'm called to, a continual offering that I'm being called to offer for my people. And so the priesthood can be scary. And as young men, we're made to do that. We're made to lay down our lives. That's why men go to a battle and they, they fight for the brother next to them. They're not so much fighting an enemy, they're fighting for the love of the brother next to them. And it just sets, that just set me so aflamed with, with desire. Can I do that? Would I do that? If somebody came in the room, what would I do? Would I run? Would I hide? Would I fight for the loved one next to me? I want to believe I'd fight. I want to believe I'd lay down my life. Vocations are never easy, um, but the sacrifice is with Jesus. Um, you know, and entering into his sacrifice, of participating with his sacrifice. Sacrifice is never a negative thing. It's always a positive thing because it's always a gift of yourself. When Jesus shows you who you are in his eyes, you realize what a gift you are to be given away in love. And it becomes easier and easier. It becomes something natural. Just looking at the crucifix and just seeing Christ there on the cross and realizing that at that moment on Calvary, it's like he held nothing back. And that is the essence of sacrificial love, is that he didn't um, consider his own comfort on the cross. It's exhausting, this life that, is, that I'm called to, but ultimately the result of giving yourself is that you receive abundantly more. I'm being called to be a priest for this church, for all of her needs, all of the needs that will come in the different settings that I'm called to, the different parishes that I may serve, and to think that God is entrusting me with the vocation to serve, to sacrifice my life so that she might have life, and that I too may receive life through my sacrifice. Yeah, there can be a real joy in sacrifice. And working at a retreat center, hearing hours and hours of confession, going back uh, to the rectory, being really fatigued, but a beautiful fatigue. And then just moving towards gratitude because of all the ways the, the Lord has used me. And once again, it can be tiring and the enemy can kind of whisper, oh, this is a burden or obligation. But when you just slowly take the time to sit and particularly before the Eucharist and realize what's been going on and how people have invited you into their lives, how they've shared with you their deepest secrets and through you, how they've been forgiven in Jesus Christ, that through the power of Jesus Christ worked through you as a priest, uh, it, there's nothing comparable to it. Parish priests are given the grace to be experts at accompaniment. We get to walk with people no matter what's happening in their life. We walk with people if they think Jesus is real. And we walk with people if they think that God is just some made up idea. We walk with people when they're struggling and we walk with people when they're celebrating. It pleased Jesus um, to call me to this life. He saw me from the beginning of my life when I was very young, and he says, I want this life for you. I want you to reveal my love um, to the world and to the people around you. The most inspiring thing I think for me about priests is their selflessness, their love for their people, their fatherly care, that paternal heart that they have for their people. Proclaiming the gospel, establishing the life of Christ, establishing good news in someone is really life-giving. And at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's this sense of, it wasn't me, it was, it was him all along. And that's, that's the best part. Don't limit Jesus by your fears and by the chattering voices of the enemy saying this simply cannot be. Say no, in Jesus all things are possible.